My name is Lena Rachel Anderson. I live in Copenhagen, Denmark. I was born in uh, 1968 in a suburb of Copenhagen, and I lived there until I, I was 21. And then I moved to uh, Copenhagen proper, and I've been living there ever since. I've traveled a lot in the U.S. And uh, when I was around 30, I converted to Judaism. And before that, I was raised a Christian, Protestant Christian, and I studied to become a pastor. And I also, before I did that, I studied business economy. So that's my background. I don't have any siblings, um, but I have a lot of friends, and I uh, grew in a really good community. My mother was a teacher, and my father is retired now, but he was uh, a shop decorator, I don't know what to call it, but uh, he was... Um, he was a craftsman before he retired. Yeah, and you know he was a wife? No. Um, and what are the universities you went to? You said you went here, right? I went to, uh, I went to Copenhagen Business School and studied business economy for three years. And then I went to the uh, Faculty of Theology and studied to become a theologian. And I, I did that for two or three years. I didn't do it full time. And while I was uh, studying to become a pastor, I also uh, wrote for television. And I've been writing since I was 12, and that's really what I enjoy doing. I'm a writer now, and a philosopher, and I write about the future, I write about modern technology, and I write about science and evolution. I was missing something. I mean, I. I I'm still intellectually, I'm an atheist, but emotionally I'm a believer, so I, I still have this thing going on inside me. I was, uh, I was missing something, and I thought that the rabbi's explanations and the concept of modern Judaism was really, it, it just talked to me, it made sense. And I've always been fascinated by Jewish culture, Jewish humor, movies, everything. And I had some Jewish friends, I also had a Jewish boyfriend, and I just felt at home in the Jewish setting, environment. So I thought, okay, I'll go see what uh, this Saturday morning service is all about. And I'd, I'd been to the synagogue as a tourist once, so I knew where it was. I knew that the women were sitting on the first floor, and I knew sort of how to behave when I got there. So I went there, and um, because of security, we had guards at the gate, and so I talked my way past them, and they explained that I should go upstairs to the first, second floor, and I, I did that. And um, and so I, I didn't really have any expectations. I just uh, hang my coat in the uh, in the uh, ladies' wardrobe, and, uh, and then I went in. And the moment I crossed the uh, doorstep to to the uh, room of the synagogue, I just had this really strong feeling of belonging that I come home, and I've been traveling all my life, and here I belong. And I hadn't expected any, anything. So it was really. It was a really strong experience and a very big surprise. And it just really took me by surprise that I, I had this emotional connection to the place because I didn't expect anything and I didn't understand anything of what was going on because everything was in Hebrew and I did not understand in Hebrew and I didn't know the liturgy. So I was, people got up and I sat down and they turned and they turned back and they uh, sat down again and I was very, very, um, I wouldn't say confusing, but um, a little bit puzzling. So I, um, I, uh, I stayed there for the entire service and had this really, really great feeling. And then I rushed out and back home afterwards because I didn't, I didn't know if I wanted to talk to anybody or, or uh, was prepared to uh, talk to the rabbi again. I just needed to figure out what had just happened. So I went back and I guess I had lunch and fell asleep. I remember I slept all afternoon and got up in the evening and thought, hey, something weird happened here. And then the next Saturday I went back because I wanted to see if it was uh, still going on. And uh, as soon as I went into the uh, room of the synagogue, it was, uh, it was there again. Not as strong, but still this feeling of, I really have to be here. I have to, uh, to, to stay here and learn and become part of this because this is, this is my home. And, and it has been so ever since. I, uh, it's a modern Orthodox synagogue in Copenhagen. And at that time I traveled a lot in the U.S. And I went to um, a conservative synagogue in Los Angeles and became a very 
active member of their community when I was there. And I started studying with a rabbi here, with a rabbi in Los Angeles. And after about a year and a half, I converted with the uh, conservative rabbi. And then I went back here, and of course the uh, orthodox rabbi did not recognize the conservative conversion, so I did it again in 2004 with the um, orthodox rabbi here. What would you say was the first time in your life you had to, but you chose to rely upon God, that you understand God? I don't think about it that way. I, uh, I don't know if, if it's God that I rely on. It's not like, it's a concept of God that is part of what I rely on. I, I think it's more I rely on people and I rely on culture and I rely on the sort of unspoken agreement that we have among us as human beings, human beings that, we, uh, that we behave when we're together and also when nobody's watching and that whatever rules and whatever um, manners or attitudes that we have towards one another we have to uh, to agree upon as, um, as human beings and we have to negotiate it, we have to, uh, to work together, we have to talk, we have to meet, we have to see each other as, as uh, worthy individuals as human beings uh, and, and treat each other with dignity and demand dignity from one another and from ourselves. And um, maybe I'm just, I don't know, maybe that is God. Um, I don't know if there's, I mean there are so many ways of looking at God or, or describing God and I think um, it's just an expression of everybody's wishful thinking. I think there is a connection between everything, but it's probably more this, at the uh, atomic level uh, and the fact that I mean, the physical world is, is connected through uh, energy and space, and uh, and that is I mean, that is about as, as deep as I can get. Whatever it is that we call God, I think is. Um, it will, it will always be a, it will always depend on our knowledge and imagination and the culture that we were brought up in and the uh, concepts of God, the possibilities of concepts of God that we've encountered. And mine is just changing all the time. What and where do you feel most connected to God or the definition of God that you just described? Mm. Tell me about a time you did feel. I mean, I, I, feel, I feel connected right now because I'm talking about something that's really important. So, I, I mean, once I'm connected to all these thoughts about it, to studying um, what God could be about or what humanity is about, and um, I also feel it whenever I study science, and I write about the evolution, and this whole idea that everything comes from the same DNA, I mean, there is a door right behind you, and it's made out of wood, and it's built out of the same building blocks as you and I are, and it's uh, 3.5 billion years old. And I just find that so fascinating. I mean, that is, man, if there was a God who invented that, that would be really smart. If, if God had really invented the DNA that could just self-replicate and make us and everything else, I mean, that would be, that would be a really, really smart God. Um, so maybe God is that smart. I don't know. I mean, that would be, it would be, it's such a simple idea. And once the DNA is there and can replicate itself, it would be so much more fun being God, just see where it, where it would take itself than actually creating you and me, or Adam and Eve, or the monkeys that uh, were closest uh, relative or ancestor. Uh, it's just, 
I, I see God in, in that process. Maybe God is the process. I don't know. Um, but I feel connected to it whenever I study it, whenever I make an effort. And um, once in a while when I'm very happy or very sad. But, um, but yeah, whenever I study, whenever I'm happy, whenever I'm sad, that would be three. That would be three uh, times when, when I feel close to God. Judaism is not just just a religion or just a, a, a faith. It's more of a discussion club. It's a, it's a, it's it's a it's a struggle with people. It's a struggle with God. It's a struggle with reality. It's a struggle with history. It's a struggle with uh, everything. And I think that's the way life is anyway. So it reflects the way life is. And there is another thing is that there are no promises in Judaism. Um, I mean. There was one incident actually. That was that would be my. Be, besides the uh, first time that I went to the synagogue in Copenhagen, it was one incident where that was a really s strong spiritual experience. That was in Berlin. I was at a uh, reform synagogue there, and there was an old rabbi who was about the Holocaust, and he was from Poland, and he was uh, going to give a sermon. At the uh, at the Shabbat service, and he was uh, walking by a cane, and his uh, daughter had to help him to the bima to to talk to everybody. And the text of that week was about what I don't remember who asks God in the Bible, but somebody does and says, "What have you ever given me?" What have you ever given us? And God's answer is, I've given you today. And you have today. And today you can do something. Um, and this uh, old rabbi, he was speaking with a Polish accent, but he was giving the sermon in German. And, uh, and the whole point of, of the sermon was, I gave you today, I gave you Hayom, I gave you Hayom. And that was just so powerful. And I think that I, I carry that with me. That only you have today. Can't promise you tomorrow. Can't promise you an afterlife. But you're here. You're here today. And uh, that's an obligation. That's all I gave you. And I think, yeah, that's true. That damn, that's all you gave me. That was today, and all the struggle, and all the hassle, and all the fun, and all the uh, all the stuff that goes on. And that's true. So Judaism doesn't promise anything it can't keep. And I like that. Is there a prayer or a part of the service that is most meaningful to you? Um, yeah, the Shema is, is, is really important. Um, listen, Israel, uh, the Lord your God is, is one. And meaning that there is just one God. I see that as everything is is connected in me. That there are not different forces struggling over me or over the world or over anything. Um, and that we should uh, listen and learn. And um, yeah. And of course, the uh, blessings before every meal, uh, to be grateful for the things that you have. I really enjoy that. Um, I guess that would, but I mean, these prayers are, yeah, blessings or prayers are like, uh, I think the Shema is, is sort of a, um, what if, um, I can call it a rebooting in your memory card, something like that. Uh, like uh, um, I say it every morning when I wake up and I say it before I go to bed. I was just, I don't know, sort of gathering my thoughts and myself and going to sleep and gathering my thoughts and myself before I get up. So it's, um, it's just, uh, I don't know what to call it, I think beyond 
where it's actually, in, and it's, uh, again, it's sort of a connection, it's just a little thing, but it's a connection to a, a bigger community history that I belong to, and uh, is there a God who hears it? I really don't know. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a thing that's important to me. And, um, and since my Hebrew is so poor, I mean, I, they're not the main Jewish prayers that I know by heart anyway, so I uh, have to be really short. Is there anything else you want to share? I think what what is really important to me, and I think that's the only way that humanity humanity can move on, is the concept of pluralism in a democracy and with an appreciation of there being multiple cultures living next to one another. And that as religious people, we have an obligation to find out how we can participate in a democratic society, how we can build democratic modern societies along with everybody else being present in those societies. And that we must embrace science and understand the difference between belief and knowledge. When you study science, you have a hypothesis, and you go out looking for everything that can challenge this hypothesis. And if you cannot find something that proves you wrong, you consider your hypothesis right. And that is scientific knowledge. And it won't last forever because one day somebody will find that one incident where the hypothesis does not work anymore, and then it has been proven wrong, and we have new knowledge. In religion, you go, you have, a, you have a faith, you have a belief. You go looking for everything that confirms your belief. And whenever you encounter something that proves it wrong, you push it away, you explain it that this was some sign of, sort of mistake, and this didn't happen, or whatever, so you can stay within your belief. And that's cool! as long as you realize that that's what you do, and that science is something else. And whenever science come up with, comes up with results that contradict your religion, you have to accept it as scientific facts, and you have to deal with it within your religion. You cannot explain science away and say, it didn't take place, science is wrong. You have to accept that there's a physical world and what we can measure and what we can reproduce in the process of science, we have to accept that, even though it contradicts our sacred texts. And then we have to deal with the text and with the religion in that context. And I think it's really, really dangerous. Um, not just to people outside our religion, but also to people inside our religion, if we cannot do that. And I think we have an, an obligation, also as religious people, to participate in a democratic process. Um, there are in all religions, fundamentalists who do not engage in the rest of the society. And um, I don't see how you can justify that. I think you have an obligation toward your fellow human beings that you uh, go out there and participate in the secular world as well. And then you can have your religion, then you can live from a religious point of view, and you can use your religious values as the guideline for what you want to do in that secular society and in a democratic process. But you have to participate. You cannot just hide yourself and not recognize that other people are people and have rights as well. So I, I think that that would be my overall message. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.